welcome back to Rating the List, where we review, discuss, and reimagine popular movie lists objectively. We're your hosts, I'm Jerry. And I'm Brad. And in this episode, we're going to be exploring number 81 from AFI's 100 Years, 100 Passions, the 100 Greatest Love Stories of All Time. All right, and tonight, number 81 is The Goodbye Girl, directed by Herbert Ross, starring Richard Dreyfus and Marsha Mason, released in 1977. All right, so the synopsis for this romantic comedy are as follows. Dancer and divorcee Paula McFadden, played by Marsha Mason, and her 10-year-old daughter Lucy, played by Quinn Cummings, live in a Manhattan apartment with her boyfriend. She returns home from shopping to learn he's left for Italy for a film role. Prior to his departure, he also has sublet the apartment to fellow actor Elliot Garfield, played by Richard Dreyfuss, unbeknownst to Paula. Elliot arrives late, fully expecting to move in, but clashes with Paula. The demanding, cynical, neurotic dancer eventually lets the equally neurotic and quirky actor move in. Paula struggles to get back in shape and resume her dancing career, and Elliot lands the title role in an off-Broadway production of Richard III. The director's vision of an exaggerated homosexual portrayal of the character leads to an awful opening night panned by critics with special attention paid to trashing Elliot's reluctant portrayal of Richard. Despite frequent clashes and Paula's lack of gratitude for Elliot's help, they fall in love and sleep together. Lucy has grown to like Elliot, but fears her mom is simply repeating what happened with her previous actor boyfriend. Elliot convinces Paula this isn't the case and also reassures Lucy, telling her he cares for her too. Elliot joins an improv theater and ends up getting offered a film role in Seattle he can't turn down. He'll be gone for four weeks and Paula fears he won't return, like all the men before him. He calls Paula from a uh, phone booth on the street, inviting her to come with him. Paula declines, but is encouraged. Before hanging up, he asks her to, to restring his prized guitar, proving he really vows to, uh, proving he really loves her and will indeed return. Okay, so what did you think? So um, initially, when we were talking about this, remember I mentioned, oh, this is a this is a, a Neil Simon adaptation. Mm-hmm. It is Neil Simon, but it's an original screenplay. Oh. So he wrote this specifically for the screen. So this isn't like one oh, of his. Oh, interesting. It's not one of his plays okay. that he adapted. I, I didn't know that. I thought it was. I thought it was a play first. Oh, I thought that it was as well. Yeah. Um, this has all the kind of hallmarks of. Yeah, it's of definitely Neil romantic com- the comedy too. Yeah. It's got, yeah. You know. This is kind of our. I think I, I want to say this is almost like our first really true romantic comedy mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah, I think so. Um, this has all the hallmarks of Neil. Body Simon. Heat was that a romantic? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so this one has like all the hall- hallmarks of uh, Neil Simon story. So you've got the whole opposites, you know, characters thing going on, like you do with the Odd Couple, or um, um, what was the movie with the, that, that was already on the list that we should probably remember at this point um, with the. Uh, Oh, uh, Barefoot in the Park. Barefoot in the Park. So it kind of, it has all that. It has the real, I mean, Neil Simon writes really, really great dialogue. Mm-hmm. He really Like, does. fantastic dialogue. Um, the one place this really falls apart for me is the whole, um, the Richard the Third thing, where they play being homosexual for laughs. It's really dated. Well, I don't think it's necessarily... Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's playing exact, for laughs. That's exactly what they're doing. They're playing They're playing it for laughs that he is portraying this as a very, you know, outlandish, over-the-top... Eccentric. Hom- eccentric homosexual character, which in and of itself is just... It, it's not funny. It's just... It's a thing. Right. And so and it's I really think, dated in that, in that fashion. And I also think that with Richard Dreyfuss' character, he's like... I'm playing Richard the Third. This is my chance to like right. really break out and show myself. And he's basically gotten a like bum deal. Yeah, in it. you know, well, he, like he, he can't well, really it, play it the way he wants. Well, to play. that's the thing. I think you could have done that. I mean, the whole real premise of that was he signed on for something that didn't turn out to be what he expected it to be, right. and you didn't have to dive into a trope that was used a lot mm-hmm. especially by 
male directors to just, you know, get real cheap laughs yeah. off of, you know, homosexual content, which yeah, that's is, true. it was silly. Um, if, if this was to ever be remade, I think that would be a, a section of the story that really, really needs work. Yeah, they could even have it as like him filming a movie or something. Like. I mean, you could do it as a play. That the, yeah. the play is fine. It's just the whole that whole aspect. Just make it about something else. So make something else about it funny. Like do like a hip hop rendition of Richard the Third or something, where Richard Dreyfus has to like, you know, use like modern language to yeah. that doesn't really work with Shakespeare. Yeah, that's it, a good idea. You know, idea. you know what I'm saying? Something yeah. like that. Something that w- would legitimately be funny. Yeah. Where you're really juxtaposed against the traditional Shakespeare that he thinks he's going to be performing and he's been like preparing for. Mm-hmm. Like he's sitting there like in the apartment reading the lines and all this and he's really like trying to get into the character and then he shows up on set and he's supposed to play him as this really, you know, over the top gay guy and he's just like, what? You know what though? Like Richard Dreyfus is so charismatic in this movie. Like I I mean it worked. He play he plays it perfectly. Well, like, I mean I'm talking about him as his character. Mm-hmm. He's very charismatic, like, he's very funny and sarcastic, and he's, you know, doing these, like, weird things to prepare for his roles, and, you know, Marsha Mason's character is, like, I'm so sick of actors, right? right. So everything that... Yeah, everything he does. He, everything he does, she's like, what are you doing? And he's, like, meditating in the middle of the living yeah. room, and he's, he's... playing his guitar, he's, like, you know, like, she comes in one time, he's playing the guitar in the nude... Yes. You know, um, <laughs> it's uh, they they both give pretty good performances. She gets to be a little grating to me after a while. Like, yeah, she's very whiny. Her her, I mean, they they play the the neurotic like over the top to the point where you know you're just like okay, give it a rest. Like yeah. he he's neurotic too, but she's like extra. She is extra. Her daughter though. Oh my god. Oh, what this a, little girl, she was a scene stealer. You know, she I, I was. Look, I looked it up, and she, she's she became a writer. Oh, interesting. So she she, she you, if you look at her credits, she's in like a few other things after that, like as a teenager, mm-hmm. but really didn't dive much into acting. And she she's just basically been a writer ever since. That's very cool. Yeah, I was I I, I was like, why did I never see her again? Because I'm like. She's wonderful. She's really good. She is like she's whip smart. Yes. And she's like she has all she's these super sarcastic. She has all these great lines with her mom. Yes. And, and also with you know with with uh, with Richard Drivers' character, and you're just like I mean she had she's a every scene she's in she's stealing it. She's yes. a, absolutely like she's just like she's playing that like 10, 10 going on forty. Uh-huh. And it really works. Like a lot of yeah. times when you overwrite a kid's well, character with really adult dialogue, it doesn't work. But she convinces well, you I, that it, that it, that it works. Yeah, and I think it's because you know she's raised by a single mom, and her sing- and her mom really kind of relies on her mm-hmm. and talks to her like an equal. Yeah. So I think that that kind of comes out with yeah. Lucy's attitude about things. Like she's a little bit more mature for her age. Yeah, it's that 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 dynamic you sometimes see in real life with with parents where, you know, the the child is almost in some aspects more mature than the adult, mm-hmm. um, and they kind of you know they have this this really strange wisdom that kids their age typically don't have, and it's yeah. kind of funny to watch. Yeah, and she like you know her she knows what. Her mom has been through with other men, and she yeah. has the same hope and fears as her mother does. Right. So, like, it really shows up, you know, yeah. when he has to leave well, it for re- Seattle. Well, it really shows up because, the, I, to me, I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily on the screen, but I think this is the first time that, like, she even, like, doesn't have, like, a lot of great things to say about her dad and the few times Mm-mm. that she's talked about him. Mm-mm. But this seems like she's like, wow, I really like this one. Mm-hmm. And I'll be disappointed too if he doesn't stick around. Right. Like when the other boyfriend left, she was just like, "Yeah, whatever, mom. This has happened like a, a dozen times." Here we before. go again. Here you we know? go again. So you know, you dated some jackass, and he did jackass things, and now he's yeah, you know, he's done. So, um, 
but you know she really bonds with the Richard Dreyfus character. There's some really sweet scenes with the two of them. Yeah, when she's in the carriage and and he kind of comes to talk to her and yeah. they're running around and she's like he's like I love your mom and she's just really yeah. scared. Mm. You know, because they've been there before, yeah. and so she is expecting the worst. Yeah. So, so overall, good movie, fun yeah. time. This is one I think really crying for a remake. I think you could still like the whole like subletting stuff still plays. Mm-hmm. That whole thing plays. I would really change up that kind of cringy stuff with the um, mm-hmm. the Richard the Third stuff. I think you got to get a it. good. You got to get actors who are about, like, turning that point I, I, to where, like, yeah. they aren't getting as many jobs and mm. they're, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, it's just like with any romantic comedy. It, it all it always falls on the two leads. Yes. And Dude, they were, they were they really were good chemistry together. Yeah. Really good. So. All right. So uh, I gave this one a 66. Jerry gave this one a 69, so the list score is 67.5, which is, I know that probably seems kind of low, Yeah. but <laughs> what happens with a lot of these is one of the criteria that we mentioned in our first video is um, about, like, diversity and stuff like that. A lot of these movies score really, really low. Really on low them. on diversity. It's really kind of a big eye-opener. Yeah, like, you watch some of these stories, and there's nothing but white people, so you kind of mm-hmm. have to ding them for that stuff. And a lot of them, the, you know, the, the people of color, you know, tend to not have really big, prominent roles in the movie. Or their roles are very stereotypical for yes, their, right. you know, race. So, so, you know, you get a few points for that, for having them, but at the same time, you can't go all the way forward. Yeah. Um, you'll see, like, uh, when we get to the point where we're integrating some movies post-2002 into what's going to ultimately be our list of 100 um, a lot of those movies do a much much better job of mm-hmm. diversity um, not only that but you know I also think of diversity in terms of how they treat the women in the movies I kind of think about mm-hmm. it on that that lens too a lot of these movies don't yeah we got a couple doozies coming we got some doozies coming with how they treat women <laughs> um, a lot of these stories were written by men they're directed by men you Most know they're, they're starring with a really really big you know, male leads, so um, that kind of always af- affects the scoring as well. So if you're wondering, 67 is actually a pretty decent score. Yeah. We have a lot of movies that are in that 60 to 75 range, like pretty much all of them <laughs> at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's going to be really interesting when we start shuffling stuff around. Uh, one, to reassemble, you know, this 100 list to see where we, where our rankings would replace them, you know, from 1 to 100. And then, you know, how many of them fall off yeah. the, the list in, in, in lieu of other things that we've watched that are going to make it on. We have a few movies that, you know, off the, the newer stuff that we've seen that have scored really, really high mm-hmm. and are definitely going to be, you know, on the new list. So. And um, if you're new to our show, if this is the first one you're watching, you can go back to our very first episode that we released and we kind of talk about how we're ranking all the movies, like what what ranking system we're using. Um, you can go back and check that out, so that way you kind of understand a little bit more about what numbers we're coming up with. Um, also, you know, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Um, we are kind of um, playing around with maybe doing like a live show or something like that, so um, your comments are much appreciated. Even critiques, we, we'd love to hear them. As long as you're nice about it. And then, um, yeah. yeah. And you can also uh, reach us at um, ratingthelist at gmail.com. So uh, that's all we have to say about the Goodbye Girl. Uh, until next time, I'm Brad. And I'm Jerry. And we're writing the list. We'll see you next time. Bye.